Okay, this week the first one is U Blocks. That's what is right. This week's item. Yeah. I love featuring U Blocks. They have such good quality products. Um, they've been making GPS modules for 20 ish years. Uh, they, you know, I remember when they, they first came out with their first series, and I was like, wow, these are really, this is really cool that they have GPS units that are so sensitive. Their, their specialty is, you know, the high quality, sensitive, a lot of information. Um, there's cheaper GPSs, but they only give you NMEA data, and U Blocks will usually give you a lot more, and they're a lot more configurable and custom customizable. So their 10th generation of GPS modules are out. The Max M10, um, there's the S series and the M series. Uh, both are very tiny. I'll show them on the overhead later, but these are, you know, this is like a centimeter by a centimeter. They're very, very small. Um, they don't have the antenna built in, but they're very powerful. And like I said, this is the 10th generation. Um, so they're just improving and improving on the technology. Um, so the Max uh, M10, yeah, like I said, uh, this is um, their super miniature module. You do have to add an external antenna. However, you know, data does come out of it. You know, once you connect the antenna, uh, it can connect to up to uh, four different uh, GNSS uh, satellite systems. Uh, and it's pin compatible with some previous products. Not all of them. I mean, I know like some of them were bigger. They've gotten smaller since then um, compared to like the rectangular style that were popular for so long. Um, so there's the M10. Uh, M and there's the M10S on the right and um, they are slightly different so the um, M10M I mean they're both basically the same core on the inside uh, they connect to the same uh, GPS GLONASS Galileo and Beidou so GLONASS is Russian Galileo is European Beidou is Chinese I believe GLONASS is up I think Galileo and Beidou are not completely up yet but I have to check because I, I'm not I don't subscribe to GPS daily, so I'm not I'm not totally up on which GNS S systems are up and running. Both have UART and I2C. We'll take a look at that. The um, M10S has slightly higher sensitivity because it has a um, additional low noise amplifier and saw filter. Uh, it also uses a temperature compensated oscillator. Uh, that's the T under oscillator, whereas the M10M has the crystal oscillator, so it's a little cheaper. Um, but it's again not as sensitive. So basically, you know, if you want uh, low cost, go with the M10M. Uh, it goes. Up, another nice thing is it goes up to five volts to 1.8 to five volts. Where the M10S um, has a little bit extra hardware in there, temperature compensated, only up to 3.3 volts. Uh, but it gets you another. I think it'll show another 3 dB of sensitivity while tracking. Um, so what it looks like. Um, and I think we'll also look at the, the pinouts in a bit, but basically inside is, you know, a, it's a microcontroller that handles the um, grabbing the data and doing the calculations and then converting it to the interfaces. So there is firmware running on it. Um, the modules you can see here, it has the, the RTC crystal and then the temperature compensated oscillator um, optional and then the low noise amplifier and the saw filter also optional on the S series not available on the M. Uh, there's power, there's VDD IO, there's VDD RF, there's a couple power supplies. And of course there's a um, V backup, which is the uh, coin cell, or I think you can also use like small rechargeable um, alkaline or lithium coin cell, you know, solderable coin cells uh, for battery backup to, to, to keep the RAM backed up so you don't have to re-download the entire almanac each time. Um, this is where you can see all this, you know, the specifications. Uh, but basically, the detail you want to look at, you know, for the difference between the two is in um, acquisition underneath sensitivity. The M10M has negative 164 dBm, and the M10S is one negative negative 167. It also has slightly faster aided start. Um, otherwise, it's pretty much the same. So just tracking is is a little different. Otherwise, um, they all have similar specs. Um, and this is the pinout, uh, very simple. I like how it's very straightforward. Uh, you can see there's uh, right hand side, there's time pulse out, that's pulse per second. Um, there is the battery supply, the reset pin. Left has I squared C, right has uh, UART. There's safe boot end because I think you can upload the firmware if you want, if you have custom firmwares. Because again, there's a microcontroller inside. Um, and then there's an RF and LNA area, which we'll talk about with, with when you have a um, active antenna, 
uh, you can use it to power the antenna and also do some uh, detection. Um, okay, so the UART interface, so, you know, standard UART and MEA output is classic for GPS units. Uh, if you need that, you got it. Uh, this one is going to um, be default 9600 baud, but you can see it goes up to almost one megabit or down to 4800. You know, all these standard uh, baud rates that you can use. Of course, if you have it, you know, giving you 10 hertz updates and you have all the sentences enabled, uh, you'll want something fast like 115 or, or 230 kilobit per second, um, 8N1. And then what I really like is they also have I squared C. I do like I squared C because, you know, for things like a Raspberry Pi computer or a, so even some microcontrollers, they don't have an extra UART. Or it's annoying because, you know, UARTs are, are you have to buffer the data yourself. So as each byte comes in, you have to quickly put it in and uh, into your buffer queue and then... Um, keep track of it, whereas I squared C it has its own internal buffer for I squared C. And then if you see at the bottom there, the register layout, most registers aren't used. You use um, registers FD and FE to read the number of bytes in the queue. And then you can just read continuously register, register OXFF to get data bytes in. I don't know exactly how big the queue is, probably like 64 or 128 bytes or something. Uh, very handy, you can run it at 400 kilobytes. One thing I do want to mention, or sorry, kilobits per second, there is a clock stretching interface. So, you know, some some chips do not like clock stretching. Um, just something to be aware of. You know, earlier Raspberry Pis didn't do a great job with clock stretching. You have to lower the frequency rate. Uh, so you'll just have to figure that out. I don't know how long the clock stretches for, but it is a microcontroller inside. It's not a hardware I2C interface. Um, these things are so small because they do not have a antenna, like some modules that you might be familiar with. And so you'll have to add either passive antennas, what a passive antenna looks like. Um, in this case, it has a uh, UFL connector or an active antenna. Active antennas are powered by clean 3.3 volts biased into the RF line. Um, but of course, you're going to get much better performance um, with, you know, with the addition of the draws an extra like 10 to 50 milliamps, whatever it takes. Um, this is an external antenna. So which do you use? It's totally up to you. You get to decide because you get to put the circuitry in. Um, so this is what it would look like for an active antenna. Um, you see there's uh, the antenna supply. You have an RC filter and inductor uh, to feed it into the antenna RF in. Um, if you're using a passive antenna, you just leave all that out. So super easy. Uh, you decide which one it is. There's also a antenna supervisor circuit, which I kind of think is interesting. Um, and this is really handy because a lot of times people, I've noticed people using, um, you know, they're using uh, antenna and it gets disconnected or the UFL or there's a short. And like my GPS doesn't work. It's very hard to debug a GPS because basically either you get a fix or you don't. So having an antenna supervisor is really handy. Um, it is a bunch of extra circuitry you have to add. Um, they do give you the layout. So like this is the three pin circuit. So it lets you detect open, closed, like shorted, whatever is it connected. It basically does everything, but it, it does require you to see, um, you know, comparator and a bunch of transistors. That said, if you want to build a really rigorous GPS um, into a product and you want to alert people that the antenna is not working or it's they maybe they connected the wrong kind of antenna um that kind of thing is what makes your product a little bit better than just like hey you know either it works or it doesn't because again gps is so opaque like either you're getting nmea sentences and either there's a fix or there isn't it usually doesn't tell you why you're not able to get a fix uh, so another thing that i thought was interesting as i was researching this is that they actually came up with a kind of a, a cool idea. I'm, I'm hoping I'm describing this correctly, but they have ThingStream, 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 which is their IoT asset management you know, service because they do Wi-Fi and they do RTK, and they do GPS. So it makes sense that they have their own IoT backend that you can stream data, and I believe they use MQTT. But what's another interesting um, thing is that so, you know normally when you have a GNSS receiver, right? It's it's you're not getting the data from the satellites that's like telling you what your location is. You get these, you know, time pulse signals and you take the calculation of the deltas and you figure out like, okay, based on like the movement through space and the 
almanac of where all the satellites are, it'll calculate for you, you can calculate your location by using triangulation. However, that does take energy and time and you have to have that almanac to know where every satellite is. And so that's why it can take like 45 seconds to do, you know, a cold start. And then this idea, which is like, well, what if you don't do that? What if you don't have to keep track of the almanac? You don't have to calculate. You just, as long as you can get a couple signals from three satellites, um, you can upload it to their service and their service will do all the math for you. Um, so it's really, really fast because you don't have to do a cold start. And then as long as you do have some Wi-Fi connectivity, maybe you have like a NBIOT, you know, you can quickly um, turn it on, send some packets out or LoRa, send out that timing data to their service and then it will calculate the location for you. So it, it's an interesting idea because on one hand, of course, you have to have Wi-Fi or cellular connectivity, but you don't have to keep track of as much, like the GPS doesn't have to do as much work. So that was kind of an interesting idea, like offloading the GNSS calculation. And then finally, uh, good timing. There's actually a webinar that they're doing with DigiKey in a week. Uh, it's uh, a week from now. So sign up. Uh, if you go to uh, uBlocks or DigiKey's Twitter account, they've just uh, posted it. It's also, if you just Google for uBlocks, Accelerate Your Wireless Solution Development, um, uses their Explorer IoT, uh, Humidity Temperature Sensors, IMUs, Sincerion, uh, MicroE, looks like the SCD40 or 41 there. Um, it looks like a really cool way to get started with you know, their, their IoT platform module that has Wi-Fi, MB IoT, cellular, um, LoRa, Bluetooth, and uh, it's got STEM and QT and Quick Connectors on it, so you can add more sensors. Uh, and I think the webinar is free, you can just, and you can pick up the Explorer IoT kit, uh, which has one of these, um, I think, Max 10 GNSS modules inside of it. So it could be a really great way to get your asset tracker or GNSS project up and running. Available at DigiKey. It's in stock. That's right. 9,000 of them. It's over 9,000. Um, so they have the S in stock. I think the M uh, isn't. But I, I will say one of the things is that like this wasn't this was not in stock when I first started the INMPI. But it was like it was so cool. I thought I would do it. And then like two days ago, suddenly they came into stock. So I did get some. I can show them on the overhead. Okay. Do you want to show that video after that? Yeah. Yes, but I just want to show this really quickly. Okay. Um, they have a cute little video, but I just yeah. want to show how unbelievably small they yeah, are. I'm gonna so have to let it refocus because it's uh, it's so it's, small, yeah. it's so tiny, um, very tiny little module. So they, I mean, it's amazing how small it is. Of course, you'll need the antenna, but um, the antenna usually goes on the outside anyways, and it comes in uh, tape and reel. Okay, here's the video. See you on the other side. Yeah. Yeah.